Hi, Fern. Muted. I'm sorry. How are you? Okay, I'm good. How are you? Good. So I have my um, more professional mic plugged in. Are you hearing me clearly through it? Yep. Sounds perfect to me. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to plug my earplugs, my earphones in. So mistake. (laughs) Take away my concentration. Okay. Let me see. So is she in the room with you? (laughs) No, it didn't. Let me plug it in here. So I'm in my summer house, but she's in, um, she's kind of, she has the lay of the land. That's awesome. Don't want her to bother us. All right. So I can't plug in the earphones. They're not kind of going in and that's fine. So, but you're hearing me like recording. I hear you totally fine. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to hope that that's going to, going to go through. So I'm going to just take these off and, um, so, and I know, you know, the drill, like we can restart things, repeat things, correct ourselves. Oh, okay. And we'll edit any mistakes out. So no big deal. Okay. Um, but I'm so excited. I'm happy to talk to you again today. Oh, thanks. Me too. It's been so long since we've chatted. Um, but things, things are definitely, um, you know, going well. I was interviewed, um, for a newspaper here on Long Island. That's pretty popular. Oh, cool. Um, it's in like, it does both East, East Hampton and, and the fork of Long Island that I live on. So that's coming out soon and somebody else. So I guess my post on Instagram and reached out to me to do an interview. Um, her podcast centers around like strong women. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's, it's going places, but Savannah and I, and I'm, I don't want to put this on the podcast, but crickets from Liz crickets. Really? And I don't, know what that means I'm trying not to internalize it or take it personal but I'm very sensitive so yeah that's tough because she's like such an idol for this right (laughs) yeah and like not really sure what's going on but uh whatever maybe maybe it's something like personal and it's you know it's just another time or whatever that's what we'll be having something going on in her personal life and also a Grey Gardens fan trespassed on the property a few weeks (gasps) ago Ooh, in a scary way um in a weird way they oh, didn't no. realize but she she maybe has mental problems and thought that oh. she was invited like oh wow. so, yeah so, yeah so maybe she's kind of like spooked from that but like she but she knows me she was on my podcast and whatever yeah. whatever it's all good whenever it's meant to be that I'll speak with her about the book we will and if not whatever yeah. you know it's all good yeah that's a shame though because I know you're so eager for that yeah, um, but I am going to get to go see Grey Gardens through a historical tour. It's so um, cool. Yeah, so at least get to be there. I'm going to like try to put my book on certain places that I'm allowed to and like take a picture <laughs> and, you know, use it for like stuff that I can promote. So that'll yeah, be Yeah, that's so yeah. awesome. You'll have yeah. to bring like the front desk worker some cookies or something and be yeah, like, seriously? I promise I won't ruin anything, but I'm going to take a lot of pictures. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Make sure my phone is t- super charged. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's cute. But the other day it was so funny because I was looking back through your folder just to get the timeline. Oh, and good. I just had this thought, I was like, I think little Edie is going to like try to get you press and like shove you into the spotlight. Cause she wants to highlight a woman, you know? Oh, good. And, I like that. Yeah. And I just had this feeling. And then like, you made my day just now saying someone saw my Instagram and I'm like, that's little Edie. Awesome. Little validation. Yeah. So it's pretty cute, but yeah. I, think, I think she's loving that she's like written about and she's I loving totally that, agree. you know, yes. I think yes. imagine like next year, I don't know, someone reads your book and then they, they're her for Halloween, you know, and she would love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That would, that would be so, so cool. Um, yeah. so, like I'm hoping like things will start to buzz around and, um, I did a giveaway on one of the Facebook groups of got gray gardens and that, that got, you know, like 300 people, um, put in for it. And I had, I picked three winners, but there's like 14,000 members. So I thought a wow. lot more would kind of get, get in, in on the giveaway, but yeah, it's okay. Whatever, whatever's, you know, meant to be, well, will be, do you know what I mean? Like it it takes time to get traction. Yeah. And it's out in the universe and that was, you know, one of the hardest parts. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's so cool. And just so you know, so I did an interview with, um, another writer back in, let's see, I'm looking at my stats here. It was in May and her episodes at 12,000 downloads. So I'm, you know, yours won't get that in the first week, but over, let's say a couple months, it'll be across 15,000 people probably. Thank you. That know that it'll, it'll definitely, definitely help. Did she, 
did she notice like, I mean, did it have an impact on her sales? Yeah. So I think it, I think it does, but I don't think it's a quick thing. Right. Um, Cause I, I don't think everyone like it downloads, but people don't listen right away, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, but she definitely yeah. says she's hearing people, you know, talk to her on Instagram. They heard us, heard her on the podcast. Um, yeah. So she says it's, it's definitely a thing that's worth it for writers. Yeah. Uh, oh, definitely. I mean, any, any way to get the, the word out, you know, be it in print, in a magazine, yeah. in, you know, a podcast, anything. It's just, there's a lot of competition out there. It's tough yeah. for writers, you know, it, it well, definitely is. Yeah. And it's really cool. Cause I think the writers that listen to my podcast, they almost, it's like they, if they resonate with the story, that's great, but it's more that they resonate with a writer who's trying to do what they're doing too. And so mm -hmm. I noticed a lot of people are buying the writers who are on the podcast. They'll buy their books. Oh, that's nice. Like, I'm supporting, you know, I'm, yes. I'm eager yes. to see like what you came up with because I'm trying to do this thing too. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, that's great for, for sure. Well, I did that with, I can't remember the author's name, but something like in the zoo, the girl in the zoo. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah. What's her last name? Lauer. Lauer. Okay. And yeah. She's had crazy success with BookBub. So she, you know what BookBub is? Hmm. You know, I, I'm going to write it down. I yeah, write it, write it and down. I, and you can, she's said, if I ever tell anyone about her, that I can also tell you that you can message her on Instagram if you have questions about this. But I, she... I did, to be honest with you, like oh. she sends back like one word answers and it's almost feels like she doesn't really want to be bothered. I'm just sharing that with you. Yeah. I think she's so introverted that that's just how she's coming oh. off. Okay. <laughs> she's right. probably intimidated by you thinking that, you know, I don't know. She's, I don't, she's shy and introverted. So she is just probably internalizing it way too much. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I didn't want to bother her. So I was like, yeah. okay, last one with her answer was yes. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I think I'm done here. But yeah. That's yeah. Well, the, you know, I, I don't blame you, but um, she's, <laughs> she's, book she's book definitely and, a uh, super nice human. Yeah. Oh uh, no, she, she looks super nice. Yeah. But I just don't think she felt like engaging, which is fine. And um, I can, you know, share when we're talking in the interview later that I'm certainly happy to speak to any of your listeners or um, <laughs> clients that, you know, want to, you know, I'm, I'm here to help, you know, and like, yeah. I'm all about synthesizing and, you know, my experience was so wonderful with you that um, yeah. I'm so happy to, to share. And I don't know if you got a copy of the book yet, but I, you I know, did. I in the back for you. And, I did. Um, it was so sweet. Yeah. And actually speaking of that, I was going to save this to later, but I loved your, um, the, the, whatever you call it in the front where you talk about why you wanted to write the story. Yeah. The author was it the author's note. Like I loved that part. Yeah. Oh, cool. I added that like kind of last minute. So, um, yeah. And I think I wrote about you in two places. Oh, and, you did. I think I only saw one. <laughs> yeah, no, you're in two places. So yeah. And, and I, well, I'll save it. I don't want to like ruin the, I'll, I'll save it for when we're talking um, on the podcast so I can make you feel special. <laughs> oh, thank you. But yeah, I got it. And it was, it's, I love it. The cover is great. And I was flipping through and I was reading just some lines where I'm like, I remember this. And yeah, oh my God. Yeah. Kind of I, have to say, and I, I won't, I don't know if you want me to say this on, on the interview or not, but oh, I was like mortified. There were five mistakes that somebody oh. found and it I happens. rectified them and I reloaded it. But I just pray to God, nobody super important out there bought a copy with five mistakes in it. And it was, it wasn't my proofreader. It was something that happened in like the upload or like half a word was missing. Like, how, how could that happen? Like, That's it was just, weird. It was more technical. It wasn't. Yeah. So it wasn't like my, my proofreader, I think did a really great job. There's maybe one sentence that needed a little tweaking, but other yeah. than that, um, like words were missing and I don't get it, but well, you um, know what I just intuited from Miss Little Edie is that life's imperfect. We're all messy. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like that. I like that. So yeah. So I've, yeah. I've loaded up the, you know, I, the, I updated the manuscript. So it's in better shape. Yeah, like, okay, well, that's, I hope that's, perfect shape, not better, perfect shape. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But I think of all the things that could have gone wrong, I would take five issues like that over like 
I've heard horror stories about oh, really? things. So oh, gosh. okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm definitely here to you know promote uh, my experience with self publishing. If if you want to you know tap into yeah, that, we can talk you know, about that. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. So whenever you're ready, we'll we'll you know jump on in. I'll just follow your lead with everything. But I okay. do not have dates, just so you know. And I'm foggy on dates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll and the, eye well, on you for that. Real quick, what I was going to tell you about Jennifer, she did the book bub in you in the UK because you have to get accepted to one of them. Oh, okay. And she tried multiple times and she finally got accepted to the UK. And she her book sales when she's doing the book bub promos have been excellent. Okay. And then because her success in the UK was so good with book bub, they accepted her for the US, which is like highly coveted. Okay. So, um, she always tells me to recommend to people try the UK one first, cause it's easier to get accepted. Awesome. Okay. And, yeah. And it's, it's, I I've seen writers use BookBub, and I've never had one be like, that was a waste of time. They're always like, I cannot believe I sold so many books. Okay. And do you have to sell them at a great discount or something? You do, or there's like packages, like you could, um, I think there's different options. So you'll have to look what those are, okay. but I think it's worth it because you're getting it in front of so many readers and getting reviews and okay. But I talking. only I only am using Amazon. I didn't use Ingram Spark because between us, I get a dollar a book, and I'm like, I'm yeah. not going to do it. Yeah, so that's that's rough. It, is it something I can do if I'm if I only like have the Kindle version they can get? I think so because okay. um, I think they even do like ebook. There's an ebook special, you know, okay. setup. So okay, cool. All right, yeah, I'll look into definitely it. Definitely worth that. looking into. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate um, but okay, so we're gonna let's just kick this off, and I'm gonna do like the typical like welcome to the show. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you do that on your show too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and then um, we'll just have a conversation. So it'll be okay. fun. All right. Sounds great. Hi, Fern. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so excited to have you here today. Oh, thank you, Savannah. I am so excited to be here on your podcast because I love your podcast and that's how I found you. And oh. um, I think you share so much with your listeners. So I'm really excited to be here with you. Oh, thank you. And we're going to have a lot of fun today because your story is super fun. Your story as a writer, but the story you wrote as well, um, which just the book you wrote just came out on October 5th. So at this point, that is we're recording on the 27th, which is what is that? 25 or 20 days, 22 days ago that your mm -hmm. book came out. So how do you feel? Uh, well, I feel hugely relieved to be honest. Um, yeah. It was three years in the making, a lot of hard work and blood, sweat and tears and dealing with a cancer diagnosis and treatment in the middle, as you know. Yes. And, um, it's a huge sense of accomplishment. And I'm, I definitely want to share that with listeners to you know, don't give up. And, you know, in the middle of writing, you can get really tough in that like muddy middle part. Um, but with, you know, great guidance and support, you know, we can get through and yeah. um, it's a great feeling getting to the other side and hearing from people that have read the book that they, they liked it. And especially fans of the movie. Um, so it really made me feel like we we did the Edies good and we really yeah. honored them. And that was very important for me um, when I was writing the book, as you well know. So yeah, it's it's a huge feeling of accomplishment for for sure. What a like great that. feeling for sure. Yeah. And so I'm gonna read uh the back cover copy in a second, but before we get there, um, can you tell us who you are, uh, what kinds of books you write and things like that? And you know, I know you have some special hobbies that you can mention too. <laughs> okay, terrific. So I live on Long Island, uh, which is in the state of New York. And I have um, a house mid island. And then I have a, a beautiful small summer house in the town of South Hold. And uh, it's a place where I, I love to go boating, we do fishing and tubing and just, you know, kind of relaxing. It's very beautiful and serene here. And I have three children um, and a wonderful husband and a beautiful dog named Daisy. She's a Bernadoodle. So if you hear her barking in this interview, please just bear with us. Yeah, she's um, going to chime in maybe from time to time. will, yeah. And um, I love to play the game of Mahjong. And it's a Chinese game that was brought to the United States in the 1920s and became all the rage along with flapper dresses and, you know, pixie haircuts and all that fun stuff. And um it's a, a tile game and it's just a lot of fun. And I actually wrote a book, my first 
book was a memoir and it's called Mahjong Mondays. And I also host a podcast about Mahjong Mondays <laughs> and the game and learning to play and, um, you know, tips and strategies and just the fun friendships everyone makes around the table. And um, that was a different experience writing a memoir. Um, and then the book that I currently wrote is, you know, what did we decide on, Savannah? Was it um, women's, I guess, women's contemporary fiction? fiction? Yeah, women's con yeah. contemporary women's fiction. Yep. Yeah. And um, it was a much different type of book um, to, to write. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we got through and, and did it. And I personally love to read, I guess, more biographies and I love to watch documentaries um I like to learn from people's life experiences that really happened I don't know why that's just very appealing uh to me and um yeah so I think that's kind of everything in a nutshell yep I think you nailed it and so <laughs> you mentioned the Edies before and so this book is about the Edies do you want to tell listeners just like a quick overview of who these wonderful women are I would love to. So the Edies, Big Edie and Little Edie Beale, lived in the infamous house named Grey Gardens in East Hampton, New York, in the swanky town of East Hampton, which is on the other fork of Long Island. And a lot of um, stars and um, the real estate's really high over there. And um, so they bought this house in the 1920s. And um, as life kind of uh, went on and the mom, whose name was Big Edie, uh, wanted to become, well, she was she was a singer. She had studied uh, voice for probably two decades. When she got married, there were some constraints put on her singing. And um, she decided, I guess, at some point that her singing meant more than, than, I guess, the constraints she was dealing with. And she started to sing and her husband was not happy with that. And, you know, being an affluent, affluent woman in the 1920s and 30s, um, it was kind of frown, frowned upon. And um, she eventually became divorced, was left with this big, beautiful house in East Hampton, very close to the water. And um, the house went into ruin. And um, it's kind of like almost like a, a gothic story where, I mean, it really became so run down and she um, loved cats and, and the the cat population grew in her home to almost 30. And then her daughter eventually moved home with her and they were going to be evicted by the town of East Hampton. And they called upon two very uh, affluent family members, Jackie Kennedy Onassis and Lee Radswell. And these two powerful women came to help their aunt and cousin. And um, there was a documentary in 1976 titled Grey Gardens and HBO also did a version of it. Um, there was even a play in the early 2000s. So it's this iconic film and this, this infamous house that really has a lot of fans and there's a cult following around the world. And I, I just kind of stumbled upon the documentary during COVID and down the rabbit hole, I went and I started to do research and um, I formulated um, a story ar around the 80s. And yeah, here we are. Yeah. Which is so fun. And with that great description, I almost don't need to read the back cover copy because you just oh. nailed the Whoops. summary. No, which is great. So, um, so you wrote a story kind of to explore kind of everything you just said, like what happened to these women? Um, what could they have felt like? Because you we don't have a lot of answers, right? No, the documentary was shot in six weeks, and it's a specific type of documentary where the documentarians don't really interact too much with their, um, I don't know what you call them, like their characters. Yeah, uh, subjects. But it was just, yeah, their subjects. It, but it was just so interesting. You're kind of like being a, a fly on the wall and, and watching these two women, and you're so intrigued, like, well, why is this woman wearing a, a head covering? She doesn't have any hair under there, and she dresses in these very avant-garde, bizarre outfits, and, you know, the mom is busy singing with this beautiful voice, and it was just very intriguing, and um, it just, I guess, captured the heart and attention of so many people over the past 50 years, and there's, you know, Facebook groups um, that center around Grey Gardens and the Edies, and there's a lot of, a lot of people out there who really adore them. Yeah, and there's even, so the house still exists, and it's in beautiful condition, and there's tours of the house, and 
You're yeah. about to go on one, right? I'm so excited. So I also <laughs> have a podcast that's titled Gray Gardens. And I started it, um, I guess maybe a year and a half ago. And, you know, during my research, I, I felt like, wow, there's so much that I'm I'm learning. And I, I really want to share this with other, you know, Gray Garden fans out there. And I've actually had the honor of interviewing Liz Lang, who's the current owner of the home. And she just did a beautiful renovation um and the way that she decorated was just incredible it was very different from the 1920s version of you know when it was first um i guess decorated by the beals and um there was an owner in between sally quinn and um she had restored everything to its original um i guess the, the way that the house looked when back in the 1920s and so she had like swatches of fabric and she would go and have you know fabric created or buy something very similar to that and um she restored the house um really to how it looked back in the 1920s and she uh really paid homage to to the Edies and um yeah so it was pretty incredible but I love the way that it looks now I think Liz Lang nailed it with her um her just iconic fashion um design and her eye it's it's beautiful yeah it's so pretty and I'm just I'm jealous that you're going to get to go see it in person and take it to her it's going to be so fun pictures. don't yeah, worry I'm sure you'll post pictures on your Instagram and all that so we'll oh, yeah. we'll make sure to put the link so you guys can all see Fern's tour in her on her Instagram fun. um but so it's it's crazy because there's so much history around these women in this house and this time but then there's also a lot of unanswered questions like, mm -hmm. you know, what really happened? How did they really get this way? What were they thinking and feeling during all of this? Right. Um, and so like, how did that factor into you wanting to write about them? I guess I wanted to give voice to the Edie's um, to kind of fill in the blanks in a respectful way. Um, and I, I just felt like there was so much more to the story and so many of the viewers, you know, are left with questions like, well, wow, like what happened? Like, how did they get like this? Like, how did they live with, you know, 30 something cats and a family of raccoons? And I mean, it was, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. And things were, you know, like cluttered and, you know, there's pictures online where they had empty cans that were five feet high, these piles of empty cans. And, um, it was, I don't know, it just, it just drew me in. And I wanted to, um, I don't know, I just wanted to create a story around them and give my version of what I thought maybe could have happened to them. And like I said earlier, it was very important for me to honor them along the way. And I hope, I hope that I did. And um, I think that it's, it's an intriguing story. And, and I wanted to also show the power of women, the connectivity of women and family members and that in a time of you know patriarchy back in the 1920s when everything seemed to be kind of like justified by you know the men of of society and this is how things are especially you know with the super affluent and um big Edie kicked things around a little that's for sure yeah. and yeah. um yeah it just shows like the perspective of a, a woman who just you know had a different vision for herself and um and I, I really wanted to pursue developing that that character. Yeah. And that's one of the things I really like about both of the Edies, the way that you wrote them and the way that they appear in the films and the, you know, all that stuff is that they're so bold and they're so themselves. And society kind of said, we're not sure about the way you are. And they mm -hmm. said, we don't care. We're going to be this way anyway. Yeah. Um, so they're very inspirational. And it's kind of like you said, we see that part of them and then we see the house they live in. And we're like, how do these two things exist at the same time? Like, how are they so bold and wonderful and beautiful and then living like this? So we just have questions, right? The world has questions. Yeah. Yeah. They certainly and that's, that's what your story really explores, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tried. Um, and it was, it was, I think just really, um, special to, to kind of delve in and to, you know, watch the movie time and time again. And I would even watch the movie and only have the audio on and really listen and like kind of delve into their lives. And I'm kind of curious to even ask you when your writers are, you know, working for three years on, on their project, mm -hmm. working with their characters, like for me, I felt like the Edies were part of my life. You know, do other, do other writers feel like that too? 
I think so. And I feel like anyone listening now is nodding their head because I think everyone gets to this point where, or at least with me and the writers I work with, we get to a point where like that character wouldn't do that. And it's like, how do we really know? Because they're made up, right? And Mm -hmm. in your case, they're not made up, but we don't know so much that in a way you kind of have to make them up. Um, So yeah, I think it's totally normal that they become such a a figure in your life. And then probably at the end, you were like, I kind of miss them, you know? Yeah. and I do. Yeah, I, I definitely, I do. Cause I would like talk to them sometimes. I mean, like I'm like driving in the car. I'm like, Hey, what would Edie do? Or like, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so not to spoil where we're going to go in this conversation, but we had to do a lot of digging into the characters to figure out, mm-hmm. you know, what are their stories really going to be about and what internal obstacle or each is each woman struggling with and things like that. So there was a lot of character work that went yeah, into you- it asked me some good questions that were really thought provoking. And I think added a lot of fullness and richness to, to both of the characters. And I don't know if I would have, you know, done it as well without you prompting and asking me those questions. All the tough questions <laughs> that probably mm-hmm. kept you up at night. Sometimes oh, you're like, why good. is she yeah. asking me this? <laughs> well worth it. Now it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, okay. So on that note, let me just give listeners kind of a highlight reel of the big picture timeline. Cause like you said, it's been quite a few years. So you, we met in April, 2022 and you had been working on it before that, right? Mm -hmm. So you Mm -hmm. kind of, you were developing the ideas you had to gather kind of what does this timeline even look like, or what could it look like? And then get that into some kind of order. And then at some point you were like, I need more help with this. Uh, So we met, we started working together. We spent some time working on an outline, which we'll talk about. Then by about October of that year, you had a finished draft. um, And then we went back through it and revised it. Um, And then fast forward to about June of this year, uh, you were working with beta readers. So we had finished the second draft. We were working with beta readers. And then, like I said, October 5th was your published date. Um, so you said three years, but all in all on the draft we worked on together, it was just over a year, which is pretty exciting. Mm, Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even remember. I'm so glad you, you took notes with, with all of those. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, and this is not an abnormal timeline either. And I like to say the months because other writers out there might be listening and thinking, God, I've been working on my draft for six months. What's wrong with me? And it's like nothing. Everybody takes you know, a while. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, because I think honestly, I spent maybe the first year writing a draft and then I, you know, finished it. And, um, and then when it came, I started the draft before I did an outline and yeah. I, so I did it backwards and, um, maybe that's when I realized, oh, I need some help. <laughs> yes. And I know, so when we met, you had already been working with another coach and you guys had sorted kind of all the ideas. And then we really dove into more like, how do we build this into a story with structure? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and one of the things, if if we can dig into kind of the actual process, one of the things I said was, I think we might need to do dual point of view and dual timeline. And I remember mm-hmm. you were like, I don't know about that. I was like, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, like, you were like, uh, can we not? <laughs> the, the first draft that I wrote was in a linear timeline. And so yeah. my head was just so fixed in in that timeline. And when you suggested it, I was like, oh my gosh. I said, well, you know, Savannah, I definitely trust you. Let me let me just think about this for a couple of days and um and then at our next session we'll we'll talk about it. And then I, I think what happened is I said, you know what, I, I I just trusted you. And if you felt that this story would best be told in a dual timeline, that I was putting my faith in your expertise. And I'm so glad that I did, because I think the dual timeline um, was an excellent way to, to write the story. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And it's so funny because for listeners, I just want to explain why we did that, because I think that's really interesting. Um, or I would like to hear that, you know, and one of the things we noticed as we were digging into your outline and the chronological version of the story you wrote is that each woman had a similar but different journey. So they were both kind of struggling with what does it mean to be a woman in this world in this time when you're not quite the typical woman or what society wants you to be. So it's like, how do we stay true to ourselves? How do we be a good mother or daughter um, and balance family and the stereotypical expectations versus what we truly feel. So that was a big indicator to us. Like we, we can 
show both women's journeys kind of overlapping each other and having one help answer questions that the other timeline raises. Mm -hmm. So like you were saying earlier, um, you know, a big question is how did it get this way? What happened? And that's kind of what little Edie in her timeline, she's, I, the, I'm not going to spoil anything, but the beginning of your book is kind of, she's looking at her mom's portrait going like, what happened? Like, how did we get this way? Um, and, and that's really what the story kind of answers from your perspective, which is fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I, and I know that like part of it, when, when we talked about the dual timeline, it's like, well, first I've been looking at it chronologically. So that feels scary, but also like that feels kind of difficult. And it was oh, a little yes. scary in that way too. Right. Yes. And you had, um, suggested a book, um, that was done in dual timeline. So I, I read that and, um, and I, and I could understand, I guess the story kind of is, it, it's written and, and, you know, just kind of shown in a different way during a dual timeline. And I like it because it's kind of like a balancing act. Like it's like kind of having a, a ball and throwing it from one hand into the other. And, um, it just creates this like fluidity and, yeah. I liked it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the cool thing too, that we realized and we, we aimed for this, but it also worked out just naturally with their stories is that we were able to line up some of those key moments in their life where like one of them had, you know, something kind of devastating happen, and then the other one did. So it's like, we're showing, mm -hmm. we're taking the reader through a very specific emotional journey through two different timelines with two different women, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just so glad that I, I said yes to it and um, <laughs> listen to your guidance because um, I'm really happy with the outcome of the story. Yeah, me too. I think it's, it's awesome. So, yeah. so then we went through the outline, then you wrote a, a draft. Um, do you remember anything kind of significant or like any aha moments or hard moments as you were writing the new draft? Well, you know, I learned so much from your podcasts and that's how I found you. And I knew that you were going to be the coach for me. And um, I'm so glad that, you know, when we connected and, and our, our timing could work and, and all of that and putting into action, the things that you were talking about on the podcast were like kind of magical moments for me. Um, I mean, some of the things that, that stood out were like the five scene commandments. Mm -hmm. And I, I use those. Um, even when I'm reading a book now, um, you and can't so unsee like, them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's the inciting incident, the turning point, the crisis moment, the climax and the resolution. Yeah. And each scene really needs to have that to move the store story forward. And, um, there's other writer friends that I, I, I have authors that, that I, you know, I speak with. Um, and they didn't know about this. And I said, oh, you have to go listen to Savannah's podcast because <laughs> there's so much good information there for, for writers. And um, so that was one thing that is really like, that was an aha moment when like you see it, when you take a, a chapter from a book and you you break it down and you can, you know, kind of extrapolate those five elements and you're like, wow. So that was really, really cool. Um, value shifts were another thing that were like very interesting to, to learn about and the different um, genre conventions. Yeah. And um, those things really, um, you know, come into play. So the specific type of story you're writing has certain value shifts that have to occur and, um, like just different elements of the story and you know I didn't know that before I worked with you yeah. and um yeah so those things really really do matter to help I think make a quality book and um yeah so I was I was really thankful for those aha moments yeah and it's fun because I'm sure there are some listeners who are they more identify being like a pantser where they like to not use these you know structural tools um mm -hmm. at least when they're drafting and and I think um what kind of what I hear you say is like, yes, we need to use these tools because they help us write a story, but also they, I would say they make it easier for the writer to write the story once you kind of internalize them. Do you agree or disagree? Yes, I, I agree. So the first draft I wrote, I had written without having heard your podcast. And so I wrote it pantsing. <laughs> and once we started to work together and, you know, implemented all of these tools, it made the second draft certainly much easier. And then we really, we broke down each 
scene. So, you know, my scenes were, you know, probably a little wishy-washy before, <laughs> um, but it, be, you know, became more concrete. And um, I saw, you know, the shift in quality was, was in incredible. So um, these yeah. tools really, really do um, sharpen the writing for sure. Yeah. And so speaking of the second draft, because I like what you just said is that, you know, maybe things were a little wishy-washy, which again is totally normal because we only yeah. know as much as we can know mm -hmm. at the stage where we're writing. But yeah. once you got to the end, and I remember we had a couple calls about like what, okay, so now we've written the story. What is it really about now? How do you feel about what you've written? And, and you had so many ideas. I remember you're like, I think it's really going to be about this, you know? So you had written a version and then it just sharpened and kept sharpening mm -hmm. until it became what it is today. So, um, you know, and I'm thinking of the listeners who are perfectionists. Uh, what would you say to somebody who's a perfectionist trying to use these tools to write a book? Well, I mean, nothing can ever be a hundred percent perfect, and we have to get as as close to what perfect could be in in our work. I think, and I think writing is an evolution. So each draft that I worked on was an evolution, and it just helps to fine tune things and. You can, as I say, kill your darlings. Um, mm -hmm. When you're working on consecutive drafts, you you kind of see what you can kind of pull out and things become clearer. Um, you know, certain themes may stand out clearer. Um, and it's it's really, it's it's an evolution. And I think that writers have to be patient with themselves and it's it's a process. And I admire any anyone who could, you know, <laughs> write a book in like say six to nine months because yeah. I can't and I uh I I went at the pace that worked for me and um you know and and I'm happy with my my final product and so three years worked for me and I, I had to spend a year on that first draft and even as sloppy as it was it gave me something to start with it was like the bones and it was like my my framework and from there um we kind of extrapolated things to formulate um, a little bit more concrete outline and then to, you know, go back and, and rebuild a stronger second draft. And um, yeah. it helped immensely. Yeah. And I like what you said about little themes popping up. Cause I know that that was definitely something that happened for you where you would be writing the scenes that we kind of had mapped out and we didn't really know, you know, what things were going to rise to the surface and which ones were going to be less important than we thought, or, or, you know, things like that. And I remember there were times where, where you or I would say like, Hey, you're kind of mentioning this a lot. Like, is this something we really want to talk about? And then it was like, yes, I really feel strongly about this, but mm -hmm. imagine if you had never gone past chapter three, because you're so worried about it being perfect, you mm -hmm. would have never found all that stuff out. Yes. Yeah, so. exactly. And you kind of have to move forward and then kind of go back and then move forward. And, and yeah. it, it has to be fluid. And I think that's one thing that you always said that this whole process is fluid. And I think writing in scenes as opposed to chapters is um, a little bit easier. So you could maybe like move things around and um, break them down maybe a little bit easier. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure if I'm, you know, so clear. You're, yeah, you're, you got it. That? Okay. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, it, um, it was, you know, I wrote in Scrivener and I would kind of like move the scenes around and we, we definitely had to do that, especially the Jackie O scene. We were trying to find the perfect spot yeah. where to put that she was, uh, she needed the right little niche in there. Um, yeah. 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 And I, it's so funny. Now we always called that our problem child scene. Cause we're like, we know it needs to be in here. We just don't know where it's going to go yet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. She was such an important part of the story. She and Aristotle Onassis helped to finance the, the renovation um, where her sister Lee was the one who was more like on, on the site and helping out because she was living in um, Montauk for the summer yeah. with her very handsome boyfriend, Peter Beard. Yeah. Um, so that was like a, an important scene for sure. But I, I think we, we put her in the right place. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Mm -hmm. And it's a, such a fun little Easter egg for anyone who's going to read the book that you'll, you'll, you'll get to see Jackie Onassis in there and some other, um, you know, fun people. So it's really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but okay. So then after that, you did work with beta readers, right. And you got some feedback. What was that process like? Was it scary, exciting, mixture of both? For me, it was exciting. Um, and again, like I, I, I took your advice on something, which was using uh, the beta reading service called the Spun Yarn. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how long it took them, maybe 30-ish 30, 30 days. Um, I was yeah. 
pretty surprised. Um, and they have three uh, beta readers from around the country. You kind of give them a little bit of background of what you are looking for in your beta reader, um, male, female, age group, type of genre that they would be reading. And um, they give a very comprehensive analysis back. How many pages was it, Savannah? Like, Oh gosh. Um, it was uh, 25, 27. It was, it was yeah, a lot. It was definitely over 20 for sure. It's yeah. And they have really charts and percentages and, and then each, each uh, beta reader answered certain questions and it was a tremendous help. So what we did is we took the areas that needed to be worked on some more. And one of them I think was feeling um, sympathy or empathy for Big Edie. So that's something that we kind of softened. We went back and we tackled any of the problem areas that they you know, had suggested where they didn't maybe resonate with the character or had a question or thought that maybe this didn't seem realistic. So um, we, yeah, we went back to work after that. And um, that was a great tool. And I highly recommend that to any of your listeners out there. The Spun yeah. Yard was great. And it's so fun because at the time that this episode goes live, we will have just had Julie Taylor from the Spun Yarn on the podcast a few weeks ago, oh, yeah. detailing that whole, um, you know, the whole process. So if you're listening to this in the future and you haven't heard that episode, you might want to go back and check it out. And also on the Spun Yarn's website, they have a, an example re feedback report yes. that you'll get. So you can mm -hmm. kind of see what we're talking about when we say you know, that charts and graphs in 20 pages. <laughs> very helpful, like for me to look at. Yeah, for, for sure. And um, I think it's a great service out there. And I didn't even know about it, um, but you did. So thank you yeah. for recommending <laughs> it to me, Savannah. It was well, yeah. well worth it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, you know, it's great because at that point, you and I were kind of like, we think this works. Like we both feel really good. We don't know what we can't see at this point because we're so close yeah. to it. So yeah. it was really great, like you said, to hear about how, you know, we were pretty close to getting it finalized, but then like big ED in some areas we needed to. I'm so sorry. I'm That's so okay. Sorry. Did you sneeze? <laughs> no, my, my friend just came in. Um, oh, okay. Shh. Daisy. Okay. I'm so sorry. If you could just repeat that. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Let um, me think of what I was saying. Um, oh, let me see. Where was I? I was talking about, about big ED. Yeah. Yeah. So there were a couple parts where it's like, we needed to soften big ED and the beta readers told us that there, like you said, there was questions. And so it was, mm -hmm. the good thing is, is it wasn't like we had to do a whole overhaul of your draft. It was just like, this is working, but here's how to make it even better. Right. Right. Exactly. And I, I think that, you know, those comments that that the beta readers suggested were definitely spot on. And like you said, we were just so close into it that we, we couldn't see these yeah you know, these little fine points that maybe needed to be tweaked. So um, I think we went in and, you know, addressed each of those issues and um, kind of softened where it needed and had clarification where it needed to be a little bit more. Um, so it was helpful for sure. And then what, in general, what's your relationship to feedback? Like just for listeners, um, you know, I know some people are kind of eager to have it and others are scared to get it. Where were you even um, before we started working together? Um. Definitely eager to to get it. Um, I'm always up for constructive criticism, and <laughs> um, you know when when you're writing something, um, I think it's important to get feedback because if you're living kind of in a in a tunnel or a cave by yourself, um, just with your own thoughts on something, um, it you have to be open to perspectives. And I think getting information, whether you use it or not, you know, it's up to you, but to hear a different perspective, um, I think is eye opening can only really help to strengthen uh, your story. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's so important to be open. And, you know, I think it does come down to getting the right people who are going to give you feedback, because, you know, of course, there are people that can ruin the experience for us by being yeah. super negative. Yes. Um, but, you know, luckily you went into it pretty open and then you had a yeah. good, um, yeah, everything you know. was, you know, was, was a, a great experience. Um, thankfully, I mean, and the, the beta readers, uh, through spun yarn really, um, I think sent, you know, constructive criticism. And, you know, one thing that I, I loved and actually brought me to tears, um, the three beta readers all said that the way that I wrote the death scenes was so touching and so spot on and so emotional. And that made me feel like validation, like as a writer to, I mean, that's what our stories want to do. We want to touch people's hearts. And, right. um, 
And that just brought like true validation uh, to me. Well, what a great feeling too. It's like you, no matter what it is that has any kind of high emotion, you hope it comes across. Mm -hmm. And then to hear that not only did you do it, but you did it really well and really affected people. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like when I wrote one of the scenes that the death scene, I was crying as I was writing it. It No, I remember. So so emotional. Yeah. And then um, I read it and I kept putting comments like, this is such a gut punch. Yeah. (laughs) I I was sad too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we won't spoil any more of that for people who are going to read it. <laughs> um, so fast forward, then we worked with beta readers, we edited it, and then you worked with other um, editors and proofreaders to get that and cover designers to get that ready. Um, mm-hmm. And then your published date was the 5th of October. So it's officially out in the world and we'll link to it and all that. But what made you decide to publish this on your own? Um, I think my experience of self-publishing my first book went relatively smoothly. Um, so I was, I was pretty happy with that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to, going to do it again. And I mean, I did think for a couple of times along the way, well, should I try to query an agent? And hmm, I'm like, well, uh, I don't think so because the process takes so long. And I think another thing that was meaningful for me is I wanted to have ownership of my story. I didn't want somebody else to pick my cover. I didn't want anyone else to change my sentences or my words or um, like this this was like my baby and I didn't want anyone else to, to own it. And, you know, when you work with an agent and, you know, they, they send it out and if it gets, you know, picked up by a publishing company, they own it. So you know, I think you can have a say in your cover design, but ultimately um, they make all the, I guess, the final decisions and you have to do your own marketing anyway. Yep. So um, I figured, you know what, like, I just want to keep this, it's near and dear to my heart and, and I, I want to hold on to everything. Yeah. And like you said, you did have a nice experience with your first book. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, yeah. And this time what I did a little different is I formatted it myself where um wow with my first book I I had somebody help me format it so what's really nice about formatting it, it yourself is that you can jump back on um to KDP and if there's any typos or any changes that you need made you can do them as opposed to having to reach back out to a formatter and you know having to to wait or to have to, you know, pay additional monies for that. So I, um, and I've actually done that. So I had to go back on and and change one or two things and kind of reloaded it. Um, So yeah, so it was a skill that was hard to learn. I'm not so tech savvy, um, but um, it was worth the learning curve. And I used a product called or a service called a vellum and you download it and um you use it you know yourself and um yeah there's definitely a learning curve but um yep it's it was it was good I'm happy I did it now you know how to do it and you can use it for your next book right yeah yeah I guess so and And, you know I wanted to share with with you and your listeners if there's anyone out there that has questions about self-publishing I'm happy to answer questions and um just to share, you know, the experience that, that I had, cause it's, it's tough. There's bumps along the road for sure. And, um, I'm all about helping other people. So just wanted well, thank to thank you for that. And if, if listeners can't tell <clears throat> Fern is the nicest person in the world, oh. so <laughs> I'm sure you can hear it in her tone and her Aww. voice and her generosity, but oh, yeah, you. she's one of the nicest humans ever. Aww. Um, but Speaking of your future book, how do you feel like now that you've gone through uh, your memoir, you've gone through this book about the Edies, how do you feel about the possibility of writing another book someday? Well, I have two in the back of my mind. One, I've kind of been going back and forth in dialogue with my son about. Um, He wants to co-write with me. Um, And then I have the original book that I wanted to start before Mahjong Mondays that is um, still like percolating in in my mind. Um, But I can't give up on, you know, on the EDs yet because I just launched it into the world. So I want to spend a good couple of months, you know, promoting it and um, getting the word out there. And that does, you know, take time. Marketing is uh, kind of, you know, labor intensive. Um, So, or time intensive rather. So um, I do have my stories, you know, percolating in in my mind. Um, So maybe in the next few months, um, I'll dive into one of them, probably the one with my son, because, um, you know, he'll, he'll be home, um, 
you know, for the summer and hopefully we'll get to spend some time. He he goes into college. So we'll have some time uh, to develop maybe the outline a little bit more. Um, Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see, but you know, writing is is definitely, it, it's, it takes a a lot. So um, yeah, I want to just a little break in between. (laughs) Yeah. I don't blame you. And to focus on the EDs and yeah, yeah, I worked worked so hard writing it and I want to make sure that, you know, I give it um, the time to, to market it and get it out there. And, you know, I've been on a couple of podcasts and I'll be in a couple of magazines. So I want to, you know, give it the time to, to get out there into the world. And um, I think that the time that we put into our endeavors in life, you know, really pays off. And um, so in a couple of months, I will definitely be diving back in and using everything that I've learned from you, Savannah, for sure. Yeah, that well, that's what I was going to ask is like, do you feel more confident about starting something new or, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I, I think, I, oh, go ahead. I, I absolutely feel so, so much more confident than um, I did even before reading, writing, rather my, my first book, um, and, you know, working with different coaches, you learn different things, but I learned so much from you. And I, I hope that, you know, the listeners out there, you know, contemplating working with a coach will choose to do it because like, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And there are so many tools that I learned from you. And I knew that you were going to be the coach that I wanted. And I waited to, to work with you. Um, I think, you know, I had to wait a couple of weeks to, for our first call, but I, I knew it was going to be worth the wait. And, um, I, I, I won't write the next book alone either. <laughs> like I need to work with you. So like, yeah. um, I, yeah, this, it, it's a big endeavor. And although I learned a lot, um, I don't think that I'm feeling confident enough to go solo at, at all. And I think to really write a good quality book, um, it helps to have coach. I, I do. Okay. That's my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's even people are always surprised when I say like, when I get to the point of needing to work with somebody, I'm definitely going to work with somebody, even though I'm a coach and an editor, because we can't yeah. see what we can't see in our own work. Right. And Exactly. And I yeah. think you know, working with a developmental editor is to me is, is essential. You know, right. it's like, cause you, that's your bones of the book. Right. And if, if you don't get the structure and the framework down properly, it's, it's going to be on wobbly legs. And, um, your, I think your expertise, you know, is really like focusing in on making that foundation as strong as it can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, it's, it's kind of fun because I'm imagining now you have tools and it's now we can take the tools and the process you have and make it more efficient. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of, I'm sure it's like a different feeling for you where before you were like, I don't even know how to do all this stuff. And now you know how to do it, but we can improve the process around it. Yes, absolutely. So, mm-hmm. Yes. So I think that's really fun. And we're going to post all the links to like your Instagram, your website, your book, and all the things in the show notes so that listeners can, you know, check out your books and also follow along on all the marketing things you're going to do. Cause that will be fun. And, you know, see the pictures of gray gardens and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Um, but any, any like final parting words of wisdom or anything you want to share with people who are wish they had a book finished like you do don't give up on your dreams and you know just like the Edies, they had dreams of their own and I don't think anyone should put an age limit on a dream or the size of your dream and if your dream is to write a book you know fulfill that dream and take take your time do it on your own timeline um, with the support around you that that you can, you know, search for and find and feel a connection to work with because our dreams are so important in life. And, you know, for me, writing a book as I was dealing with cancer treatment, it was um, almost like a beacon of light for me. I mean, I was laying in bed for many months. And um, this is the one thing that that like helped kind of get me through every day I was, I was writing even as tired as I was. And we still, you know, kept up our, our weekly meetings. And I think having goals is so important in, in our life and um, just, you know, write on and, you know, keep going and uh, just believe in yourself. And the, the title of my book is staunch. And I think everyone listening is a staunch writer and just believe yeah. in yourself and don't give up. I love that. And I was going to say, this is like perfectly describing the vibe of the Edie's and the book you wrote about them. Cause 
it, it's all about them following who they truly are and following their dreams despite everything else. And right. uh, it's, you just perfectly captured it there. Thank you. Yeah. But okay, Fern. So it was super fun to sit down and talk about all this. I mean, we we have just wrapped up together not too long ago, but I'm, you know, I'm, I always love talking to you. Um, I think you're going to inspire listeners and help them take so. action. So thank you for sharing everything you did today. Oh, my pleasure. And I want to thank you for being such an amazing coach and developmental editor and helping me fulfill my dream to write a book and to honor the Edies. And thanks for your podcast, because I've learned so much as I'm sure your listeners feel as well. And um, just keep doing what you're doing, because you are helping us to be staunch writers. No, oh, thank you. I love that. I love being part of the staunch club. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you, Fern. So tell everybody where we can find you, and then we'll post that in the show notes. Um, but just let us know real quick. Okay, so on Facebook, I'm Fern Levitch Bernstein. And on Instagram, I'm Fern Bernstein Writes. And I have two podcasts, the, um, sorry, and I have two podcasts, Gray Gardens and Mahjong Mondays. And I think that's it for my, for my uh, social contacts. Yeah, awesome. And we'll put all that in the show notes with your books and everything. But thank you so much for spending time with me today, Fern. And I can't wait to see all the marketing efforts and your pictures at Grey Gardens and all that. So good luck. And we'll have to have you back for the next book. I'd love that. Thank you so much, Savannah. Thank you. And we're and done. Mistake. Okay, great. So at the ending, I just like, you can probably just edit through through my, um whatever I just finished at the end when I was saying my uh, my podcast, I think I fumbled. So I just did Yeah, that's okay. Okay. We'll figure it out. Okay, um, excellent. That was so fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really great. And I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. And I really hope that, you know, I can help any of, of your listeners. And if you have any writers that, you know, need to reach out to someone for like a referral or, or just any questions, you know, I'm, I'm here to support you oh, and you. my great experience working with you. And, um, you know, if anyone has a question, whatever, I'm just, you know, shoot them my, my email or whatever, my <laughs> anything, my text, you know, and I'm happy to. Okay. Yes, I will I love. Okay. That's so nice. Thank you so much. And okay. yeah, make sure you're posting Miss Daisy on Instagram. Cause I want to see more of her. <laughs> I know I should. I'm not too good with that, but I will. All yeah. right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Fern. Okay. Take bye. Care. Thanks, Savannah. Okay. Bye.